Welcome to Good Book. I'm Mark Strauss, and we are continuing our 18-week series on the whole Bible. We've referred to this as history, because it really is his story, God's story from beginning to end. We went nine weeks in the Old Testament, the volume one, the Old Testament story, the promise leading up to the fulfillment, and now we're doing nine weeks in the New Testament. We started the New Testament last week by looking at the intertestamental period, that period between the Old Testament and the New, or so much history happened that set the stage for everything that comes in the New Testament, gives us a setting in which to understand the New Testament. So this week, we're going to begin the New Testament, and I want to give you a very brief overview of where we started way back, the theme of the Bible as a whole. The theme of the Bible, as we said, was is God's salvation, God's plan to bring humankind back into a right relationship with himself. So we summarize the whole story this way. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth as a perfect place for his human subjects. He created human beings as the pinnacle of his creation. But human beings rebelled against him, rejected his authority. And from that point on, then God launched a plan to reconcile and restore people back to a right relationship with himself. And that plan comes to its culmination and climax in Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, the Savior. The Old Testament, then, is really all about God's purpose and plan, setting the promise to bring about his salvation. The New Testament is about how that plan is accomplished through the coming of Jesus and then the expansion of the message of salvation through the early church. We also pointed out before that the the progress of the story moves forward through a series of what we call covenants. Covenants are a binding relationship with an individual or group based on promises and responsibilities. Remember, God makes covenants with individuals, and he calls them to be faithful, to obey him. And through them, he's going to bring about the coming of the Messiah. Just some of these covenants, the covenant with Adam and Eve, to be faithful in the garden, that they they failed at that. So he launched his plan of restoration, the covenant with Abraham. He said through Abraham, he would bless all nations. The covenant with Moses and Mount Sin- at Mount Sinai and the Israelites to keep the law, and through them they would be a light to the nations. The covenant with David, where God promised that through David he would raise up a king who would reign forever in righteousness um, and in, in peace. And then finally, the promise of a new covenant in Jeremiah 33, which is essentially the New Testament. Testament means means covenant, the fulfillment of God's promises in the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Salvation from our sins based on his death on the cross. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that we receive when we come into a relationship with, with Christ. That's all as part of the fulfillment of the new covenant, the New Testament promised in Jeremiah 33. The Second, let me, or, or third, let me give you the literary forms of the New Testament very briefly. What is the New Testament made up of? It's made up of a number of different documents, basically of three different kinds. It's, it's made up of narratives. Narratives are stories. It's made up of letters written from individuals to individuals or to groups. And then it's made up of a book called Revelation, which we call apocalyptic literature, which sets the stage for God's final act, how he's going to bring his salvation to conclusion and climax. Under the narratives or stories, just as we looked at narratives in the Old Testament, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, We also have the book of Acts. That's also narrative. The book of Acts, the the, the four Gospels tell us of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. The book of Acts then tells us how the message spread through his church to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts was written by Luke, one of the the Gospel writers. So we put those books together, Luke and and then the book of Acts. Following the period of Jesus, when the church was established, Christians would write letters to each other. Some of those letters were inspired by God, so have been preserved by the church. In the New Testament, we have 13 letters of the Apostle Paul, written from two two churches or two individuals. Then we have eight other letters, Hebrews, James, two letters of Peter, three letters of John, and the letter of Jude. So those are the epistles or letters of the New Testament. And finally, we have the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation written by John, which, as we said, talks about God's final act, basically, as God's going to bring all of human history to its climax and is going to establish a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem where we will live for him with ever. 
the consummation of the salvation that he promised from the very beginning after the fall of humanity. All right, so we're starting into the New Testament proper, and we start off with those four Gospels. Um, and we're going to look at three of those Gospels very briefly today, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the Synoptic Gospels. But let me just answer a question before we move into a brief survey of each of those, four, uh, each of those three Gospels. Um, the, the question is, why four Gospels in the New Testament? Think about this. Why do we have four accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why not one? Why not just one all-encompassing story that tells it all? Why do we have four Gospels in the New Testament? Let me just give you two possible reasons, anyway, for you to think about. Um, one is, that, is a historical reason. Basically, the four Gospels are written by four individuals in different church contexts in the early church. And that their particular context had certain needs, concerns, issues that they wanted to address. So they drew from the stories, the many, many stories about Jesus, to address those issues and concerns. So different church communities with unique needs. Each gospel writer emphasizes particular themes to address the needs of their particular community and also to address the church as a whole. Just as an illustration of this, Mark's gospel seems to be written to the church in Rome that was suffering extreme persecution. So Mark wants to encourage the church through the story of Jesus, how Jesus was willing to go to the cross, was willing to suffer and die, but he achieved victory through that suffering, through that sacrifice. And he calls on the church in Rome and then all suffering believers throughout the world and throughout history to be willing to suffer for Christ because victory will come after suffering. So each gospel writer emphasizes particular themes to address the needs of their community and then the church as a whole. So that's a historical reason, but of course there's also a spiritual reason or a reason related to the inspiration of Scripture. The Holy Spirit wanted us to, give, to, to receive a multifaceted portrait of Jesus, to, to see him from different angles, to understand more fully who he is. So each of the four Gospels really contains in some ways a unique portrait of Jesus. They're complementary, not contradictory, but they give us a particular look at Jesus. So we, we understand who he is better and what he accomplished by looking at the four distinct portraits. Now, the, let me just give you a, a, a statement for the four portraits, and then we're going to look quickly at three of those portraits. This is just an overview of, of sort of the central theme of each of the four Gospels. I would call Matthew the gospel of the messianic king of the Jews. Matthew's is the most Jewish of the Gospels and the one that most focuses on Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of, of the, the, the Jewish religion and the promises that have come through the Jews. The Messiah, of course, was the promised king that, that God promised would, would come and arise and would establish God's reign and throne forever. So the messianic king of the Jews. As I mentioned, Mark stresses Jesus' suffering. So we, we call Mark's gospel the suffering servant of the Lord or the gospel of the suffering son of God sometimes because Mark has a strong focus, or even stronger focus than the other gospels on Jesus' suffering and death as a sacrifice to pay for our sins, to bring us back into a right relationship with him. Luke, I would call Luke's gospel the gospel of the Savior for lost people everywhere. Luke has the most inclusive vision of the gospel, where all people of all walks of life, of all cultures, of all languages, come together as the one body of Christ. How the, the message of salvation is not just for certain people or one group, it's for all people everywhere, the Savior for lost people everywhere. And then we've got the gospel of John. In many ways, we'll cover that next time, next week, because it's, it's a unique gospel, very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke in many ways. I, could, I would call that something like the divine son who reveals the father. It's all about who Jesus is, the, what we call Christology, the identity of Jesus as the self-revelation of God. I mentioned the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a lot in common, and John is very different. Let me summarize that. Ken will talk a little more about that as, as, we look at, as he looks at the Gospel of John, but let me just give you a brief overview. The word synoptic, that's a strange term. Synoptic means to view together. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar, and so we view them together commonly. They have the same basic structure, same basic outline, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And then John is very different. And let me point out some of those differences between the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospel of John. 
for one thing, um, in the Synoptic Gospels, really you have one movement. Jesus' ministry begins in Galilee in the north, and eventually he comes to Jerusalem in the south. And after he comes to Jerusalem and has conflict with the religious leaders, he's arrested, crucified, and rises from the dead. In John, we have a very different geographical presentation. As Jesus moves back and forth quite a lot between the north and north Galilee, where he was raised, and Judea. He's often found in Jerusalem at the various festivals of Judaism. And so you've got this geographical difference between the Synoptic Gospels and John. Related to that is, is the time frame. There are few time references in terms of festivals or the time of the year in the Synoptic Gospels. You could actually fit Jesus' ministry into one year in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus comes to Jerusalem where he suffers and dies at the Passover festival. In John's Gospel, though, as we said, they, there's this back and forth motion. Jesus frequently comes to Jerusalem during these festivals. And in many ways, he's presented as the fulfillment of these festivals. And because he's coming to Jerusalem multiple times, his ministry, we know, was at least two and a half to three and a half years long. We learn that only really from the Gospel of John. Uh, third, the, the nature of the material is different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot of these short little, what we call pericopes. Pericopes are short little vignettes, and they move from one to the other. There'll be a healing story, or the story of Jesus walking on water, or feeding the 5,000. And it's a short little vignette, almost a little gospel within the gospel. And these vignettes are strung together in a series to, to carry the narrative forward. John has fewer of these short little episodes and more extended dialogues. Dialogues between Jesus and individuals like Nicodemus or like the Samaritan woman at the well. Or conflict debates between Jesus and the religious leaders. They go back and forth. And they'll go a, for a long period. They'll go for sometimes like a, like a whole chapter. So very different style of material. Different content in some ways. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the emphasis is really on Jesus as the Messiah, the king who fulfills the promises made to Israel, who's establishing, inaugurating God's kingdom as the king, as the Messiah or anointed one. John's got a much stronger focus on Jesus as the preexistent, the one who existed for all eternity, who is truly God, fully God, fully human, the one who came to reveal the Father to us, to bring us back into a right relationship with God. Of course, John 3.16 sort of summarizes that up, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That sums up sort of this, who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. All right, so there's, there's the difference between the synoptics and John. We're only going to look at the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and obviously we're going to look at them quite quickly. We'll cover each one in about a five-minute overview of their central theme, and I'll dive down into a couple key passages. So let's start with Matthew, the first gospel. In many ways, it's good that it's the first gospel because it, it really is a transition from the Old Testament to the New, the promise to the fulfillment. And the central theme all the way through Matthew's gospel is this theme of promise and fulfillment. And it comes out, promise and fulfillment comes out in various ways. From the very beginning, it comes out in a genealogy. The gospel begins, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then what follows is this long genealogy. And we look at genealogies in our culture, and we go, why? It's just a list of names. But this was incredibly important for the Jewish nation and for the first century church, right? The, the genealogy is structured around three sets of 14 generations. It starts with Abraham and goes to David. Then it goes from David to the Babylonian exile, and then from the exile all the way to Jesus to show this lineage from Abraham to David to Jesus. Crucial. Um, the first line and the, 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 the two most important members of this genealogy are Abraham and David because that's what Matthew says, the first line. The son of David, the son of Abraham. That's crucial, those two names. So what's the significance of the son being the son of Abraham? We have to go back to those covenants. Remember, the, the whole story carries forward through a series of covenants. And the covenant made with Abraham said this, the Lord had said to Abram, that's Abraham's name before God renamed him Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. That's the nation Israel. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And here's the key. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
Abraham was promised that through his lineage, through his descendants, all nations would be blessed. So for Matthew to say, this is the son of Abraham, means that Jesus is the one through whom all the blessings come to the nations. The blessings of salvation come to the nations. Not just the son of Abraham, the son of David as well. How is that significance? What does this mean? Well, we mentioned the covenant made with David, right? Here's the covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. I will be his father. He will be my son. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Whereas this starts to describe Solomon, it then points to a time, Solomon, David's son, it points to a time when a king would reign forever on David's throne. This is the promise of the coming Messiah, the king who's going to establish God's kingdom, who's going to accomplish salvation. Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham, all nations blessed. The covenant made with David, he is the Messiah who's going to reign in righteousness and justice forever and ever. So you can see this promise fulfillment through the genealogy. There's other ways that Matthew shows this promise fulfillment. He has these what we call fulfillment formulas. By formula, it means he, he says the same thing again and again. And, and the phrase he says is something like, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. So you'll see this. As you read through Matthew, you'll see it. Ten times he uses that exact phrase. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. So event takes place or Jesus says something and, he, and Matthew pipes in and he says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And he points back to that Old Testament fulfillment. Now there's 10 of these fulfillment formulas. Then there's about 10 more that actually quote the Old Testament as fulfilled in Christ. But there's 10 with this same formula. So the virgin birth is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7:14. Jesus' escape and return from Egypt is the fulfillment of Hosea 11.1, 1, and so on, all the way through. The murder of the Bethlehem infants fulfills Jeremiah 31.15. Jesus' childhood in Nazareth fulfills an unknown prophecy. We don't know what, what he's quoting there. Ministry in Galilee, Isaiah 9.2, and so forth. You can see, all the way through, there's this theme of promise fulfillment, promise fulfillment. The Old Testament is pointing forward, ultimately, to the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Now, some of these fulfillments, as you read through them, you realize they're not uniquely fulfilled in Christ. And what I mean by that is this is not something in the Old Testament that's pointing exclusively to the Messiah. Some of these prophecies are pointing to someone back in the Old Testament period who foreshadows or becomes a model or type of who Jesus is going to be. Of the, Jesus fulfills this typology. And typology is a major theme in Matthew's gospel. Now, what is typology? A typology is an Old Testament person or thing that points forward, that symbolizes and foreshadows, pointing forward to the coming of Jesus. There's all kinds of typology throughout the New Testament, but Matthew is particularly brings out some of these key types, where something that happened in the Old Testament points forward to the coming of the new. Let me give you a couple of examples. Jesus as the new Moses. Right? We know who Moses was led the exodus in, from, from Egypt in the Old Testament. But Jesus fulfills the role of Moses in many ways. Moses was a type pointing forward to what Jesus would do. Uh, for one thing, Matthew presents five different sermons or discourses by, by Jesus. This sort of reflects the five books of the Old Testament, the five books of Moses in the Old Testament, known as the, the Pentateuch. Jesus goes up on a mountain. Who else went up on a mountain? Well, Moses went up on a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, to receive the old covenant law. Well, Jesus comes up on a mountain and in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives these things where he presents the Old Testament law and then qualifies it or clarifies it, gives us the true interpretation, the true, true meaning behind the law. So he'll say, you have heard that it was said, do not murder. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So he points to, to the Old Testament and says, this is the underlying principle behind that. So Jesus is giving this new covenant law here. Again, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Moses giving the, the, getting the Old Testament law is symbolic and points forward to Jesus delivering the new covenant law. Here's another example of typology with reference to Moses. The transfiguration. 
Remember what happens at the transfiguration. Jesus goes up on a mountain and his, his face is, is glorified. He, his glory is revealed. And when he comes from the mountain, his face is still glowing. And the same thing happened to Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain and, and when he came down, his face was glowing. His face was radiant after coming down from Mount Sinai. So there's symbolically, Moses is pointing forward to the coming of Christ. Now Moses' glory faded. Jesus' glory will never fade. So there's, there's comparison in these typologies, but there's also contrast in the typologies. So Jesus as the new Moses, there's a typology. Here's another one in Matthew. Jesus as the new Israel. The new Israel, the fulfillment of who Israel was to be in the old covenant. Uh, like Israel, Jesus is called the Son of God. He's the Son of God. In, in the Old Covenant, it says, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So in the same sense, Jesus is the, is the ultimate Son of God. Israel as a nation was pointing forward to the coming of Jesus, the true Son. Return from Egypt is part of the fulfillment of that Jesus-Israel typology. Hosea 11.1 1 is fulfilled by Christ. Out of Egypt I called my son. The temptation in the wilderness is a model of this as well, pointing, pointing forward to Jesus as the, new, as the new Israel. Here it is. Jesus' 40 days of temptation in the wilderness are analogous to Israel's 40 years. And the three Old Testament passages Jesus cites um, are all related to Israel's failures in the wilderness. So 40 days, 40 years, testing in the wilderness, temptation in the desert with, with, with Jesus. And so you see this typology going on where an Old Testament character or figure points forward to the coming of the New Testament. All right, let's move on to Mark's gospel, the, the second of the synoptic gospels. Matthew the first, Mark the second. The central theme of Mark's gospel, the gospel of the suffering son of God. The gospel of the suffering son of God. The theme is the suffering Messiah is the model for our discipleship, that we are to take up our cross and follow Christ, to be willing even to suffer for him. As we go through Mark's gospel, there's two key themes, two halves, we might say, to Mark's view of Jesus Christ, his presentation of who Jesus is. The first one we could call the mighty deeds of the powerful Son of God. As you start reading Mark's gospel, you see there's no birth narrative, there's no birth stories. Instead, he jumps right into the, the, physical, the story of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. It's an action-packed gospel focusing on Jesus' miracles and, and acts of power. The key word for the first half of the gospel is authority. Jesus acts with authority. He, he heals the sick with authority. He casts out demons with authority. He calms the storm by speaking with authority. He forgives sins. He heals or he feeds the multitudes. Everything is about Jesus' power and authority, proving and demonstrating that he is indeed the mighty Messiah and Son of God. So the whole first half of Mark's gospel is confirming that Jesus is indeed the mighty Messiah and Son of God. You get to the midpoint of Mark's gospel, and there's a key transition. Um, as we move from one theme, the theme of Jesus' authority as the Messiah, to the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. And the key passage here, the key central core passage, is Peter's confession. So let me zero in on Peter's confession. It's in, it's in uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now this is key, this is climactic. Jesus has been demonstrating he's the Messiah through his authority, through his power. And Peter now gets it. He's seen these miracles and he understands Jesus is the Messiah. So he reached the middle point of the gospel here. Based on all that Peter has seen, he can say, you are the mighty Messiah. You are the one who's going to conquer the enemies of God and establish God's kingdom. But then Jesus makes a, a key twist here. He defines the role of the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside, though, and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. When Jesus says the, the role of the Messiah is to suffer and die, Peter says, no way are you going to suffer and die. That's not right. You're going to conquer. You're not going to suffer and die. And Jesus rebukes him and says, you're missing the point. 
The role of the Messiah is to suffer and die. And from this point on in Mark's gospel, the emphasis is on the way of the cross as Jesus heads to Jerusalem. So the first half of Mark's gospel, the authority of the Messiah, confirming he is indeed the mighty Messiah and Son of God. The second half, demonstrating the Messiah's role is to suffer and die. Now, in the first century, this was significant because people would say, he can't be the Messiah. Jesus can't be the Messiah. Look, he was crucified. But all along, it was part of God's purpose and plan, Mark says, that the Messiah would suffer and pay the penalty for our sins. So you've got these two halves to Mark's view of Christ, the, the mighty Messiah and Son of God and the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. And then the gospel also has a strong application related to that. And that application is that we are to take up our cross and follow him. That we need to be willing to suffer and die, even suffer and give our lives for him. That's what true discipleship is. After Jesus announces the Messiah's suffering role, he says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Follow me through suffering to glory. That's our call as disciples. All right, that's Matthew and Mark. Let's look at the third of the Synoptic Gospels briefly. The third is Luke's Gospel. Give it the title, The Gospel of the Savior of Lost People Everywhere. Luke has the most inclusive vision of salvation. The, 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 gospel, the other gospel writers emphasize the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles as well, but the strongest emphasis on the diversity of the message for all people everywhere comes in Luke. Let me illustrate it this way. The question, who are the people of God? In terms of Israel's religious elite, they would say, we are. We are the true people of God. If you want to be the people of God, you've got to keep the laws the way we keep it. You have to follow our traditions. Luke says that's not it at all. Look at, look at all of Scripture. He says, the people of God are all who believe, all who believe, all who respond in faith, all, all who recognize their need of me and are willing to, to, to repent of their sins and follow me. So it's not just these, th those who are externally religious. It's the sick. It's the poor. It's tax collectors. It's the demon-possessed. It's Samaritans who were hated. It's the oppressed. It's women and children who had very low social status at that kind. It's those who are unclean, like those people with leprosy. And, and it is all who respond in faith. And that's Luke's inclusive vision as Jesus goes and, and ministers to people of all walks of life. So what I want to do, I just want to, in our closing moments here, I want to point out three key passages in Luke's gospel where this theme comes out. We can't obviously follow through the whole gospel, but I want you to see three key themes. The first one is in Luke chapter 5. If you have Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 5. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee when he calls Levi, a tax collector, to be his disciple. Now, this was shocking. Tax collectors were, were hated by the Jews. They were viewed as complicit, working with the, the Romans and, and, and as cheats and extortionists. But Jesus calls Levi to be his disciple. And then Levi invites Jesus to eat at his home. And the religious leaders see this, and they're shocked by this. And they say, he goes to eat with, the tax, with tax collectors and sinners. How can he do this? He's supposed to be a respected rabbi. And Jesus responds with this. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's the central theme of Luke's gospel. I haven't come to call those who are self-righteous, who think they don't need God, who think they're good enough. He said, I've come to call those who recognize their need of me. And the sinners and the tax collectors who are coming to Jesus symbolize those who recognize their need of Christ. So that sets the stage in Luke 5. It sets the stage for this theme that, that shows up throughout Luke's gospel. Two other passages I want you to see. Flip over to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 begins like this. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the same scene we saw in the call of Levi, Jesus, they're accusing him of eating with the wrong crowd. And Jesus then tells the parable, three parables, all, all concerning lost things. One is about a shepherd who loses, a, a sheep wanders off. He leaves 99 behind to go and bring that one shepherd back. One is about a woman who has a lost coin and she turns the house upside down. One of 10 coins is missing. She turns the house upside down to find that one coin. The last one is the most famous parable Jesus ever told, the parable of the prodigal son, where a son wanders off. When he finally comes home and repents, the father welcomes him freely, welcomes him as his son, the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. And so this sort of epitomizes Luke's whole gospel, that Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. 
The last story I'll just mention, and that is the story of Zacchaeus. It's in Luke chapter 19. And it's the climax of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem now. He's about to reach Jerusalem where he's going to accomplish salvation. He's passing through Jericho. And you've probably heard the story of, of Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus, the wee little man who, um, who was, was looking to see Jesus. He couldn't see Jesus. He was too short, so he climbed a tree uh, to see Jesus. We love to tell this in Sunday school as you know, kids love to see adults making fools of themselves. And was Zacchaeus up in the tree. But what's most significant in the story is that Zacchaeus is identified as a chief tax collector. Not just a tax collector, but a tax collector over a tax tax collector. The worst of the worst. And yet Jesus calls him to to, to, to come to salvation. And he goes and he eats in his home. And when he goes and he eats, the people say this. They saw him and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. There's that theme again we saw in Luke 5, that we saw in Luke 15, that Jesus is dining, he's he's fellowshipping with sinners. And the the people now, not just the religious leaders, the people are grumbling about this. And Jesus responds like this. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That, in many ways, that verse, Luke 19.10, is the key thematic verse of Luke's gospel, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, pointing back to the lost son, pointing back to the lost coin, pointing back to the lost sheep, that Jesus is there to, to, for those who recognize their need of him, who are willing to turn to him in faith. The gospel for lost people everywhere. There's the central theme of Luke's, Luke's gospel. There's a message the world needs to hear. Um, the world is hurting right now. People all over the world um, hurting from this COVID disease, hurting from, from racism, um, hurting from conflict and war. We have the answer. We have the answer. The answer is that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He brought us salvation. He's brought us into the fold. Now he calls us to reach out and go and share the good news of salvation to those who've never heard it. Would you take some time this week to look around you, see who's in your life right now, see who you come across, and share God's good news, good news of salvation with those who've never heard it. Would you close your eyes with me as we close our time with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for your gospels, four unique portraits of who you are that give us a multifaceted view of Jesus Christ and what he came to accomplish. But I pray that that as we read and study these, we would see the truth of this message and that you would give us a desire to share the good news we've received, the salvation we've been given with others, with those who've who've never heard it. Uh, Lord, help us to be those who seek and to save the lost, who go out and and look for those in need and are willing to share your love with them, bring them them to a right relationship with you. I pray that this week you would give us opportunities to cross paths with someone who needs who's hurting, someone who needs to be encouraged, someone who needs to hear the good news of salvation that you provide. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget on Tuesday evenings, we have our good book Q&A time. Um, Come together on Zoom. If you don't have that link, uh, you can email Pastor Ken. He'll send it to you. We have a great time together just discussing the the topic for the week. discussing all kinds of great questions. So be sure and join us Tuesday evening, 7.30, Zoom Q&A.